Tes. Oke. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan, Good Morning everyone. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asrofil anbiya wal mursalin wa ala alihi washabihi rasulillahi ajmain amma ba'du. The Honorable Muhammad Sayuti PhD, the Dean of Faculty of Teacher Training and Education, the Honorable Dr. Ani Susanti MPDBI as the Head of English Education Department, the Honorable Stephanie Ojiri PhD, today's guest lecturer from Purdue University USA, the Honorable Ahmad Budairi MED PhD as the moderator of today's webinar, the Honorable all of the lecturer and of English Education Department and the respectable all of the participants and committees. First of all, let's say thanks to our God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the universe who has been giving us his blessings and mercy so that we can gather in this webinar. Second of all, may peace be upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who has guided us into the right ways of life. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Aisha Hril Surya. As Master of Ceremony, I would like to say welcome to the International Webinar Series of English Education Study Program with the theme Narrative Inquiry and Introduction for Emerging Qualitative uh, Research. Before starting our agenda, let me explain the agenda schedule of this webinar. First opening, second main agenda, third Q&A session, and the last is closing. The first agenda is opening. Let's open our event today by reciting Basmalah together. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The next agenda is the main agenda which we are waiting for explanation from our guest lecturer, Mrs. Stephanie. But before that, let me introduce Mr. Budairi as our moderator for today's webinar. Ahmad Budairi, MED, MED PhD, earned his master's degree in TESOL International at Monash University in 2013. He went back to Monash University to pursue his doctoral research study in literacy and language education, which he successfully completed in 2019. He has had an extensive experience in teaching English for various purposes and to different age groups of learners from seven years old primary school students to university students and professionals. He also spent five years working in hospitality industry, providing in-house English training for hotel and resorts in Bali. His research interests include academic, critical pedagogy, critical discourse analysis, digital literacy, practice, and multi multimodalities, language and identity, curriculum and material design, creative pedagogy, and also language policy. So for Mr. Budairi, time is yours. Thank you. I'm sorry, you are muted, sir. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Aisha. And welcome everyone to today's special session with Dr. Stephanie Oldiri of Purdue University, Indiana, America, who will be delivering a lecture on narrative inquiry for emerging researchers. And I'd like also to acknowledge um, the presence of our Dean here, Papa Sayuti, thank you very much. It's uh, our honor to have you. Uh, Terima kasih, Pak We hope today's session will enable us to have a, a better understanding of narrative inquiry as a methodological approach within a qualitative research paradigms. As we might have understood that uh, narrative inquiry is a relatively a new field. And the use of narrative as a methodological approach could be very challenging and at times confusing as well for all of us here who are thinking of uh, doing this research for the first time. For example, in the context of uh, our you know, practice as uh, teachers and as students as well. Uh, we might be thinking of uh, how 
we can understand how students and teachers uh, make sense of the reality around you know, educational practices. For example, we must still have to grapple with the questions of how narrative inquiry may differ you know, from a case study, yeah. uh, where we also rely you know, on interviews you know, as our primary source of data, as well as we might ask ourselves how, for example, uh, narrative inquiry may differ in terms of uh, methodological choice and theoretical underpinnings uh, from phenomenological study, which also relies on interview as the main, our main access to information. And also maybe the last thing that we might be thinking of at the moment when we do narrative inquiry is how we can address the issue of trustworthiness in a narrative inquiry. What does narrative mean? Is it similar to a narrative as presented in a novel, for example? And how can we ensure that you know, our analysis uh, uh, has uh, met the criteria to be trustworthy? With that in mind, you now uh, allow me to especially greet Dr. Stephanie Oldbury, who is already present here. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Stephanie Odgiri. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. It's our privilege and honor to have you uh, as the guest lecturer of today's event. And uh, before Dr. Stephanie uh, starting to present uh, today, I'd like to introduce uh, our notable speaker today. Uh, let me go through the, uh, this short uh, biography. Dr. Stephanie Olgiri is a clinical assistant professor of curriculum studies at Purdue University, Indiana, America. She holds a MS in secondary education from Indiana University and a BA in political science from Purdue University. Dr. Odgiri began her career as a US middle school and high school social studies and language arts teacher and has 10 years of teaching experience in a wide variety of school settings, parochial, charter, alternative and public and working in both US urban and rural settings, she has served demographically diverse populations, economically disadvantaged students and students with special needs. The overarching concentrations of Dr. Olgiri's work is on social justice and practices that contribute to enacting ethics of care for Latin immigrant and minoritized students in rural communities. Her research focuses on increasing pre-service teachers' level of cultural confidence and deepening their level of understanding of their students' customs and beliefs, which contributes to a culturally enriched classroom's environment to increase quality instruction and students' capacity to learn. Additionally, she engages in research that examines pre-service teachers' partnerships with community organizations that serve local populations and how working in these sites helps to develop competence and culturally responsive teaching and learning practices. So allow me now to outline the uh, presentations, the sessions today with Dr. Stephanie Bordigiri. So we will have Dr. Stephanie uh, presenting uh, this lecture uh, for more or less 60 to 90 minutes. And after that, there will be a question and answer questions. Uh, we will spend around 45 minutes. However, you might want to ask uh, questions uh, during Dr. Stefan's uh, presentation, 
And for that, you can always write down on the chat box. Yeah. And after that, then uh, we will have a closing ceremony where uh, there will be a presentation of certificate. All right, now I'd like to welcome Dr. Stephanie and please uh, have a, a round of applause for Dr. Stephanie. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning to you all. I appreciate uh, being invited to speak today on narrative inquiry. Uh, I do believe that you have received my PowerPoint. Um, and so I will um, feel free to look through that. And if you do have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to, to um, interrupt and ask questions. Um, so for today's presentation, we're focusing on the introduction to narrative inquiry. So if you are a um, emerging qualitative researcher who has been interested in this type of work, my job and my goal for today is to introduce you to the basics of um, what narrative is, why a narrative inquirer might be interested in this type of work, um, the philosophical underpinnings and theoretical underpinnings of narrative, I will give a few examples of the various genres within narrative inquiry. Um, specifically, um, my own work, I just had a book published uh, on an, a very extensive narrative inquiry. And then finally, um, some food for thought or next steps if you're thinking about a narrative inquiry. Please, 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 please. So if you could go to slide three, please, that would be great. Thank you, I appreciate it. So often as a, a qualitative researcher and a narrative inquirer, people will ask me, why did you choose narrative inquiry over case study or autoethnography? So my answer to that is grounded in autobiographies, narrative inquiry focuses on understanding and making meaning of experience. And tonight, or excuse me, today we'll talk about Clandon and Connolly who paved the way for narrative inquiry. And as a qualitative researcher, use to make meaning of the world narratively. And as you follow me through this presentation, or as this journey, as I like to call it, I hope that you will gain a sense of the complexities of narrative as a methodology. A narrative inquiry is grounded in a particular wonder, and this wonder leads to complex narrative threads that are interwoven and difficult to disentangle. Landon and Connolly talk about these as stories lived and told. And throughout a narrative inquiry, illuminations in the forms of livings, tellings, relivings, and retellings serve as a guide as a narrative inquirer comes to know and make meaning of a participant's experience. And as a qualitative researcher, I am interested in the relationships that exist between a researcher and participant, because at the center of a narrative inquiry are these relationships that make this particular methodology so special. Because we are humans, we leave storied lives. And by using narrative inquiry, we as researchers embark upon this journey with our participants and it is built in trust. There's a vulnerability that exists within this reciprocal dynamic relationship and stories serve as this window into the multi-layered complexities of ever-changing experiences. And I would say that narrative inquiry is unique within qualitative research because as researchers, we begin to make meaning of participants' lives. We come to know ourselves, hence the autobiographies. And as I engage in narrative inquiry deeply, I often find myself fully embracing the beautiful complexities of story life. And so this, through this cultivation of stories into narrative experiences, narrative becomes an important piece of narrative or of qualitative work. Slide four, please. Thank you. So narrative is both phenomenon and method, is, is method and has an extensive history in our education system. Emerging from the postmodern era of qualitative research, narrative relies upon several social science fields. So we're talking history, philosophy, anthropology, psychology, and linguistics. Jerome Bruner, some of you might be familiar with his work, he advanced narrative inquiry as a rigorous methodology within social science research. And Bruner identified two modes of thoughts, pragmatic and narrative. 
as ways of humans coming to know and understanding what is meant by truth and reality. So now we're talking the epistemological um, pieces. The pragmatic mode of thinking is found within quality of research and leads to good theory, tight analysis, logical proof, sound argument, and empirical discovery guided by reasoned hypothesis. These are all pieces that you'll find in quantitative work. However, we're talking qualitative. So focusing on human experiences and actions, the narrative modes of thinking incorporate these feelings and goals, perceptions and values of people who we want to understand our participant. And thus it leads to ambiguity and complexity. And hopefully throughout my presentation, you will understand and begin to come to know that narrative is complex. Um, and as a way of legitimizing narrative inquiry within social science research, Bruner really posited that pragmatic and narrative modes of thinking come to live side by side, complementing one another and thus offering further validation of narrative work. Um, Bruner began this work and Polkinghorn really did pick this up as he described the terms narrative as a discourse form in which events and happenings are configured into this temporal unity by means of a plot. And so now we begin to think of narratives as stories. And he went on to define narrative inquiry as this linguistic unique form suited for displaying human existence as situated action. Narrative describes narrative, excuse me, descriptions exhibit human activity as purposeful engagement in the world. And this type of discourse composition draws together diverse events and happenings and actions of human lives into thematically unified processes, which we'll talk about later. Um, so both Bruner and Polkinghorne recognize the importance of this paradigmatic and narrative type thinking complementing one another. And adding to Bruner's work on the various types of thinking within narrative inquiry, Polkinghorne focused on narrative configurations and qualitative analysis. Polkinghorne posited two paradigmatic types of analysis, analysis of narratives and narratives of analysis. And I know that can be quite confusing with the narrative, so we'll break that down further along in the presentation. But for now, analysis of narratives uses the paradigmatic process to collect stories as data and then analyze them, moving from stories to themes. And I'll explain this later in my own work. Narrative analysis uses narrative configuration to focus on data as a cohesive plot. So when you're thinking about the different points of a story, characters, plot, setting, climax, conclusion, um, so th that's often how we think of, of narratives, or it's one way of thinking. So in further developing these narrative paradigms, Bruner and Polkinghorne highlighted the importance of human activity as purposeful engagement, not only within the social sciences, but also within the field of education. Slide please, or five please. Oh, my apology to interrupt a bit. Oh, sure. uh, would you be so kind as to perhaps uh, speak at a slightly slower pace as we yes. try to accommodate, you know, different levels of, you know, proficiency. Yes, of course. Things. Thank My you. apologies. Yes, thank you. Right. Now it's slide five. Yes, please. Thank you. So according to Connolly and Clandinen, the study of narrative focuses on human experience as a holistic quality. The basis of narrative inquiry is grounded in mutual storytelling and what we call restoring, in which the voices of both the researcher and participant become known. Narrative inquiry allows for caring relationships to be established that not only promote a more equitable relationship between researcher and participant, but allow for true collaboration. Miriam and Tisdell, as published in 2016, stated that, quote, qualitative researchers are interested in understanding how people interpret their experiences, how they construct their worlds, and what meaning they attribute to their experiences. These experiences occur over time in a fluid motion and draw from past present and future events. According to Chase in 2011, as researchers 
we come to know the experiences of our participants. The relationship between them becomes entangled, allowing for co-constructed meaning of selves, realities, and identities. Narrative inquiry is much more than the retelling of stories. Rather, it situates those experiences within a larger context. Connolly and Clandinen first introduced narrative inquiry into the field of educational research. They ground their work in Dewey's theory of experience and educational philosophy. They define narrative inquiry as, quote, a way of understanding experience. It is collaboration between researcher and milieu. An inquirer enters this matrix in the midst and progresses in the same spirit, concluding the inquiry still in the midst of living and telling, reliving and retelling stories of the experiences that make up people's lives. And this focuses on both the social and the individual context of our participants. These interactions are categorized by three dimensions of narrative inquiry, temporality, sociality, and place. And these are known as the commonplaces as ways of distinguishing narrative from other methodologies. So just as I mentioned that narrative inquiry is complex, it is based and grounded in these three dimensions, temporality, sociality, and place. Temporality refers to place, things, and events that a participant experiences and encompasses their past, present, and future. Sociality refers to the social conditions found within experiences. These social conditions comprise the cultural, social, institutional, and linguistic narratives, which are both experienced by the researcher and the participant. Place refers to events that take place in a particular place or places, which helps to situate events. As stories unfold, the researcher and the participant enter into an entwined relationship comprised of shared experiences. As leading scholars in the field, Clandinen and Connolly created a foundation of what narrative inquiry is within educational research. And with that said, boundaries require expansion and tensions unpacked within narrative. And we will discuss tensions later on in this presentation. So I have chosen for this morning four particular studies within narrative inquiry that are most recent. Slide six, please. Thank you. And before I discuss each study specifically, I wanted to talk about the four or the, there are several genres within narrative inquiry that you might find interesting as you are on this journey. The first being autobiographical narrative inquiry. Autobiography encompasses a diverse kind of narrative that engage historically situated practices of self-representation. So when we engage in autobiography, we are centering ourselves within our study. Autoethnography is in which we systematically analyze ourselves as the researcher, our personal experiences, but they're embedded in a larger social and cultural context. The next category or genre of narrative inquiry is the biographical piece. And this is grounded in Bill Dung's roman, The Complexities of the Human Experience. 
And often this type of genre focuses on personal growth and identity identity, development, excuse me. Finally, and one of the most emerging and more recent pieces to narrative inquiry is arts-based. And this can be in the form of literary. So if we're talking poems and stories, um, different vignettes, or if we are looking at visual components, such as audio and video. But in arts-based, we are looking at narratives as a way of conveying meaning of stories told and retold, which we will talk about later on in this presentation. Slide seven, please. Thank you. So to help you come to know narrative inquiry as a research methodology, I have selected four studies that will hopefully aid you in better understanding how the relationship between a researcher and participant develops. Because again, at the heart of a narrative inquiry, it is that relationship, that co-meaning that we enter into as researchers with our participants. The first article, and excuse me, all, art, all of these particular articles come from 2018. And I'm happy, I, I believe, to share those references with you. So the first article by Green emphasizes the reflexive nature of narrative inquiry within qualitative research by understanding the complexities of lived experiences. The second article by Lowry speaks to the positionality of the researcher using autoethnography, again, focusing on the reflexive nature of narrative. In the third article, Masta elevates participant voice to a new level by using small story narratives, thus advancing the field of narrative inquiry. Often in narrative inquiry, we talk about the grand narrative. However, with Dr. Masta's work, small stories become powerful when working with marginalized participants. And finally, in the fourth article, Shu advances the field of narrative inquiry by focusing on narratives of marginalized populations within society and educational research. Each article offers an authentic experience into the storied lives of those who are marginalized. Each amplified voice is profound. And not only will you be drawn into the story, but hopefully you find a space within each study in which you identify with the participant and the researcher. Additionally, the reader finds themselves humbled by the multi-layered stories. And this is very important within narrative inquiry. Never is it just one story. There are many stories that are entangled within one another of both the individual and the researcher. And so you are left with a sense of wanting to learn more about the social context of each story. Again, it's not just a story to be told. It is more entangled and complex. And Clandonen and Connolly ascribe this wakefulness to narrative inquiry due to the engaging fluid nature of this form in qualitative research. Slide eight. Thank you. So first I want to discuss bricolage within narrative inquiry. The French term bricolage and bricolure were first used within the academic field by anthropologist Levi Strauss. While both terms were conceptualized as a way of understanding and analyzing mythical thought, recognizing the importance of this work within academia, 
qualitative researchers further advance the idea into a theory of qualitative bricolage. As an interdisciplinary approach to research, bricolage embodies a critical approach and blurs genres for multiple epistemological and ontological views. Although many types of bricolers exist, including interpretive and narrative, methodological bricolage allows researchers to expand one's discipline to move into a domain of complexity. The bricolage exists out of respect for the complexity of the lived world and the complications of power. So often when we enter into a narrative inquiry, into a relationship with our participants, there is the issue of power. There's always a power dynamic. And as you are co-creating stories with your participants, you hope that you are entering into a relationship that is built on trust and mutual respect. And so that there is a power balance and not an imbalance. So Dr. Jennifer Green in 2018 published this, an article titled Unveiling the Storied Lives of Teachers Through Qualitative Bricolage. And I highly encourage you to read this article because it is profound. She speaks to the adaptability of researchers using narrative inquiry within educational research. This article argued that through the use of bricolage, the researcher participant relationship becomes more nuanced and allows for rich, thick descriptions of experiences. Dr. Green used bricolage to explore the complex, sensitive, and messy topics found within the storied lives of her participants. She argued that a reflexive methodology enables researchers to explore the phenomenon creatively and robustly. So using both narrative and heuristic inquiry, Dr. Green originally planned to explore the experiences of teacher leadership. However, she came to understand uh, through data collection and analysis, the opportunities provided through bricolage, meaning responsive interviewing. Her traditional ways of interviewing became more complex. She not only wrote memos while she was in the field, but they became reflexive. And this allowed her to interpret and analyze her participant stories through a more mm -hmm. personal lens. By adopting bricolage as an in-depth approach, the researcher was able to make meaning of her participants. She also situated herself within the study that allowed for authentic relationships with participants to flourish. She noted that the depth and emotional connection that she had with her participants was important during the interview process. And she had intimate knowledge of not only the participants, but also the program that they wanted to implement in their school. So through this intimate knowledge, the lines between the researcher and participant became blurred. And of course, she had to step back and reflect on this critical work and those conversations that she had with her participants. Something really we'll talk about this morning is tensions. Throughout a narrative inquiry, it is not uncommon for tensions to arrive. And so in Dr. Green's study, she made note of those tensions as they arose when partic participants asked her to not only become a researcher, but to advocate on their behalf. So through these varying narrative techniques, 
such as responsive interviewing, critical conversations with participants, and polyphonic storytelling, she argued that bricolage offered her freedom from other methodologies by empowering researchers to explore sensitive topics related to human behavior. The in-depth conversations that she had with her participants around linguistics and cultural dissonance led to combining her inquiry of heuristics with narrative techniques, thus allowing for a shift in focus from teacher leadership behavior to cross-cultural interactions. Finally, with this type of genre within qualitative research, I value bricolage because it allows for growth as a researcher. You begin to think about your role in, through multiple lenses. The nature of human experience is complex and open to various modes of interpretation. And bricolage affords a researcher the opportunity to explore narratives through multiple lenses, thus allowing for multiple ways of knowing. Next slide, please. Thank you. The second article by Charles Lowry is titled An Autoethnography of Culturally Relevant Leadership as Moral Practice lived experiences through a scholar practitioner lens. And this focuses on autoethnography. There are many parallels between narrative inquiry and autoethnography. Autoethnography has become popular within the social sciences because of its one person representation and allows for researchers to examine their own experiences within a greater social and cultural context. Ellis defined autoethnography as, quote, research, writing, story, and method that connect the autobiographical and personal to the cultural, social, and political. Encouraging autoethnographers to adopt a critical approach, Foley argued for researchers to consider the historical and cultural context in terms of knowledge production, thus grounding their reflexive practices in the lives of ordinary people. Within the space of autoethnography, Bachner imagined this methodology as a way of constructing people's lived experiences through stories as meaning. Where narrative inquiry takes this a step further is that we as researchers co-create meaning with our participants. What makes autoethnography unique is its reflexive component. Reflexivity is a constant internal analysis. Reflections begetting reflections in what Foley viewed as a constant mirroring of oneself. Often accused of navel gazing, Holman Jones, Jones posited that autoethnography was a balancing act, a world in a state of flux and moment of movement between story, context, writer, and reader. It creates charged moments of clarity, connection, and change. So it's not uncommon for a narrative inquirer to begin with an autoethnographic piece, to situate oneself within one's research before entering into a relationship with one's participants. Within qualitative research, autoethnography provides a unique in-depth lens. While the researcher is the object of that research, they are also a participant. And through autoethnography, the researcher is actively and intimately engaged in the pursuit of meaning making. 
And again, this ties connect, connected, excuse me, this ties directly to narrative inquiry in which the researcher is very much focused on making meaning of a participant's experiences. So through or by engaging in, these, in this vulnerable discourse, the researcher amplifies the significance of the participant's voice and highlights profound experiences within the greater cultural, social, and political context. As both researcher and participant, autoethnography is unique within qualitative research because of how a participant constructs and interprets authentic lived experiences. And I chose this particular study because of the way in which it examined the experiences of a former bilingual teacher and a school principal and the way in which the researcher chose to look through multiple roles and lenses to begin with his own identity. In attempt to make meaning of his participants, he was also making meaning of himself. And throughout Lowry's study, he writes several vignettes. So often we talk about stories within narrative that are part of findings. And in this case, Lowry wrote vignettes that talked about his role as a teacher and as a principal and moving back and forth between those two roles. So I also recommend Lowry's work in order to understand how autoethnography works and is embedded within narrative inquiry. Slide 10, please. Thank you. As a qualitative researcher, I am an instrument and my research questions drive every decision that I make. And we will discuss this further on the presentation. Within narrative inquiry, the voice of the participant is central to how participants make meaning of their experiences and how a researcher comes to understand those experiences through the tellings and retellings and relivings of those stories. Within narrative inquiry, in a relatively new direction within qualitative research, is small stories narratives. And this first drew attention to personal narratives in terms of small stories with an emphasis on everyday storytelling as living narratives. So for example, when I'm in the field and I'm usually in a classroom with teachers, I engage in formal and informal conversations. And what I have found is that these small stories that participants feel comfortable sharing become part of this larger living narrative. As a way of understanding humankind, researchers have found that everyday narratives lacked a sense of direction, but through an active exchange of dialogue between researchers and participants, stories were shaped and reshaped, thus becoming situated in meaningful experiences that might otherwise go unnoticed. So again, for example, in a classroom, if you are interviewing a teacher, you might find yourself very much engaged in the larger story. Maybe they are having a conversation with families or they are interacting one-on-one -on -one with a student. But often those small stories or small narratives reveal something deeper. So the other interesting thing about small stories is that rather than polished narratives, these narratives are often told without a prescribed direction, meaning that the narrators are often surprised or distressed 
in retelling their experiences. And often the researcher finds a more in-depth and meaningful story. These are also known as underrepresented narratives. And Dr. George Akopalu viewed small stories as talk in interaction and social practice of recent events, thus providing a space for narrative analysis and narrative inquiry to work in relationship with one another. As small story narratives continue to gather traction within qualitative research, these narratives have found their way into the field of education. Instead of big stories, these small stories have been unfortunately ignored. And by casting small stories aside, we as researchers ignore the marginalized experiences of individuals. Therefore, as researchers, small story narratives counter how we come to make meaning of what is deemed important and what becomes discarded with data collection and data analysis. And as a narrative inquirer, as you are collecting data, and once you re the, reach the data analysis stage, you will find that depending on your research questions or your particular wonders, you will create boundaries in which some data becomes important to those research questions. And then other data is set aside for potentially another theoretical framework or even another methodology later on. And so I chose Dr. Masta, who is also a colleague of mine, her article, her 2018 article titled, I am exhausted everyday occurrences of being Native American because her use of small stories highlights the complexities of identity, a participant's sense of belo belonging and views on education. And while my own work does not focus on indigenous methodologies, small stories and small narratives amplify the voices of participants who are marginalized. And what Dr. Masta did was that she used indigenous methodologies that were lesser known within qualitative research and paired them with narrative inquiry so that she could understand the experiences of her participants. And it also highlighted a discussion of lesser known methodologies. The candor in which Dr. Masta uses narrative and her researcher positionality is purposeful because it highlights the significance of conversations as a way of understanding deeply her participants' experiences. And with regard to my own research, I use small story narratives as a way of understanding the experiences of teachers, specifically in terms of developing semi-structured interview questions. I see this type of methodology as being useful in terms of creating a more conversational dialogue between the researcher and participant. Often within a narrative inquiry, participants worry about whether they are providing the researcher with the correct answer. Instead, small story narratives allow for meaning to develop organically. Small story narratives also speak to the trusting relationship that a researcher develops with a participant. My research focuses on teachers working with a highly sensitive population in the United States, immigrant students who are also undocumented. Within these immigrant populations, 
conversations between the researcher and the participant regarding a family's legal status becomes part of the dialogue. Participants must feel comfortable knowing that our conversations are confidential. Slide 11, please. Thank you. As teachers, we are naturally called to be activists. Each day, we work with students, families, administration, colleagues, supporting one another. As a former teacher and teacher educator and qualitative researcher, I seek ways to understand the experiences of teachers who work and care for immigrant students. Researchers who work with marginalized populations feel a sense of responsibility because their work often reveals a stranglehold of oppressive meta-narratives. As researchers pushing back against the status quo through the use of counter methodologies affords both the researcher and participants to become agents of change. So the last article that I will talk about today is on counter narratives. So within narrative inquiry, counter narratives is probably the most new innovative push within narrative inquiry. And the use of counter stories affords researchers the opportunity to move narrative into a critical moral realm. As Delgado stated, counter narratives have the power to attack complacency, pushing against the dominant narratives to promote, quote, rich narrative reserved of untold and unwritten stories, quote, for those who experience acts of dehumanization. If I were to identify a gap within narrative inquiry, I would point to a lack of counter narratives within immigrant populations, in particular, the voices of undocumented students. Kim described counter narratives as a kaleidoscope of experiences, but overall does not dedicate enough space to this genre of narrative inquiry. Hopefully, as new researchers take up the scholarship of counter narratives, the voices of historically marginalized populations will be amplified. So for the sake of time, I want to just briefly share the last article um, by Shu titled Multi-Layered Analysis of the Experiences of Undocumented Latinx College Students. And then I will talk about my own work specifically. So using narrative inquiry, counter this particular article talked about critical and reflective voices of participants, creating a third space or counter narratives so that the individuals who had been discriminated against for various reasons may find some type of recognition, identification, or validation in their stories and the stories of others who have undergone traumatic and negative experiences. Research focused on marginalized populations provides spaces for participants to address dehumanizing experiences, but also allows for a reclaiming of their history through the amplification of voice. Slide 12, please. Thank you. So I recently published a book titled Struggling, and this is the cover, Struggling to Find Our Way, 
Um, this is a narrative inquiry. I spent one and a half years in a U.S. elementary school, and I followed three teachers and the principal, and my focus was on rural education. So I live in the Midwestern part of the United States. We have several schools that are considered very small, um, away from the larger cities. And within these schools are, are marginalized populations. So I focused on the Hispanic populations, students whose first language was not English, and how teachers interacted with these students grounded in theories of care. Slide 13. Thank you. So I will just share what this narrative inquiry looked like and um, feel free to stop me and ask questions. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, a narrative inquiry is a three-dimensional space. And so Dr. Fillion talks about walking in the midst, meaning as a researcher, you have a, a question, a wonder, and you're hoping that you can find a space, a site that will allow you to be open with participants and to discover that particular wonder. Um, but you are walking in the midst of stories, meaning stories, your participants' lives already exist and you are just capturing a small piece of their story. So this idea of experience and story really is grounded in these livings and tellings and the relivings and retellings. So as a researcher, when you enter into a relationship or when I entered into a relationship with these teachers, uh, they told me their stories. I had interviews. I observed them in the classroom every day. I interacted with their students and the families. I lived in the community. So I, I had a sense of who my participants were and the community that I was studying. The relivings and the retellings come later when I was analyzing my data and trying to make meaning of how my participants worked with their students. Did they care for them? Did they not care for them? And so it was quite complex. And each participant was unique and had their own stories. And so I spent a lot of time looking inward, turning in, as I collected data in the field and then looking outward as I reflected on my participants' experiences. Next slide, please, 14. Thank you. Oh, I can tell. I just saw a question. Uh... I conducted the research by employing other. Do you have questionnaires? Mm -hmm. Yes, that is a great question. Thank you very much. Um, and that actually speaks to being in the field. So um, that part of living and telling is also part of the autoethnographic piece. So in my book, in the beginning, before I set foot in the school to collect data, I wrote about my own experiences as a teacher, my experiences as being a Muslim who attended a Catholic school in Indiana, in the United States. And I used those stories to position myself as a researcher before I entered into a relationship with my participants. So that's a great question. It is possible um, and I recommend crafting questions that help you begin to 
unpack your own narratives um, before you uh, research, you know, before you interview your participants and observe them. So being in the field is this negotiated and very carefully negotiated relationship. Your participants have to trust you. So with my participants, I had to almost prove to them that I was trustworthy, that because this is a very small town, that I was not here to just take information from them, that I was was looking at helping them improve their school and as a teacher. And that was part of my goal was to focus on how could we create more caring environments for immigrant students who had just arrived in the United States and were looking to make their home here. So also being in the field meant beginning with in-depth portraits of my participants. So this began with them telling me their stories uh, with a narrative inquiry, I recommend a minimum of three interviews because that the first interview helped me to understand who they were. We explored their own identity as teachers. The second interview focused on their actual teaching practices. How did they work with multilingual learners? Did they understand how, as white females, did they understand how to work with students whose cultural, linguistic, racial backgrounds were different from their own? The third interview focused on practices of care. How did they care for students in the classroom academically, socially, and emotionally? And how could they tell? So I did record audio record all of my interviews and I transcribed them to myself. I know some researchers will pay to have transcriptions done. I recommend doing it yourself. It is time consuming. However, it is worth it because as you listen to your participants' words, and you reflect on the pauses, what they said, the words that they used, things that they omitted from the interviews, that also is part of the story, part of the narrative. And then finally, because I do classroom-based research, I spent every day in the classroom gathering data, taking notes, taking photographs of the classroom, observing teachers, teaching the words that they said, their physical interactions with students. All of this became part of the larger story. Slide 15, please. Thank you. Within narrative inquiry, it is not a linear progression. It is often you are in the midst as a researcher in data collection, but you are also writing stories about your own past. So the autoethnography piece, you are writing stories about the social context. In my case, I wrote about the rural site and the political landscape of the town, the county, and therefore of what was going on in the classroom as well. For my stories, I wrote 12 vignettes or narratives that specifically come from not only my field notes where I was taking daily observations, but also my researcher memos where I was reflecting each day on what I had observed and what I thought about it, how I felt emerging tensions. And these 12 narratives 
became the basis for my findings. Uh, they were not my complete findings, but they were the beginning. And so I wrote one particular story or narrative about a boy in a blue box in which the teacher, the, the young man did, did not speak English. The teacher did not know how to communicate with him. And therefore she sat him at a desk in a box and would not allow him to leave. And he was physically, emotionally, academically isolated from his classmates and from the teacher. And the repercussions that this had on the students learning. Slide 16, please. So as a narrative inquirer, this idea of returning to your research puzzle, your research questions, in order to compose your field text. Um, we come back to Polkinghorne's analysis of narrative and narrative analysis. And there is no wrong way to analyze your data within narrative inquiry. It, the data speaks to the researcher because it is you, as I mentioned earlier, you are the instrument. Therefore, you are analyzing your data from day one. Um, and so for me, I wrote those 12 classroom narratives. Then I had always had a theoretical framework. I actually, for um, my study, I had three theoretical frameworks that I used um, in order to analyze what I was observing in the classroom. Um, oh, hi. I will get to your question in just a second. Um, but reading across the, and thank you for your question. Um, so as I was observing the classroom and my notes and transcribing my interviews, I read those documents multiple times. Within a narrative inquiry, you can never read your data enough because each with each iteration, something new comes to the surface and you become to understand your participants in multiple ways. You think about them through their past, their present and the future. And that's what we mean when we talk about that temporality, sociality, the three dimensions. Um, and the theoretical framework is something that is important within not only your narrative inquiry, but within qualitative research for that alignment. Um, and I'll describe how I did that in a second. Um, let me answer this question. Um, oh yes, of course, I can send that to you. The PowerPoint, okay, sure. Um, as next slide, please, 17. Thank you. So um, for, as I mentioned earlier, I had three, three, excuse me, three theoretical frameworks that I used to move me from my field text. So my, my daily notes in the classroom, my researcher memos to my research text. And I used three theories of care. Uh, there's no set number of theories that one needs to have within a narrative inquiry, but it depends on the amount of layering. So for example, I was looking at care, Nell Nodding's, she is the foremost scholar on care. So what her conceptualization of care was, but then because I was looking at Latinx or Hispanic students, I used Angela Valenzuela's work because she specifically talks about Hispanic students in the United States. And then finally, I used Geneva Gay's theoretical framework, culturally responsive care, because that speaks to what teachers can do for students in the classroom to support them. Slide 18, please. And I just wanted to show this theoretical framework that I used to analyze my 
interviews. So I interviewed my participants uh, three times throughout the course of a year and a half. And I use the various stages of this particular theoretical framework by Kristen Swanson to, as I read and reread and reread my transcripts, um, I would code. And so coding, again, there is no wrong way to code narratively. It has to make sense to you. And because there are five components to this particular theory, I would, I had all of my transcriptions typed out and then I had a uh, Microsoft Word document that I would cut out um, quotes from my participants that fit with each framework. And that was my first layer of analysis. And I did this multiple times. I actually went through several iterations of analysis to make sure that one, I understood what my participants were saying about teaching and that it also fit within the theoretical framework about care. Slide 19, please. So I would say that the hardest part of a narrative inquiry is the composition of research texts because Throughout a narrative inquiry, your participants are telling you stories. And you, as the researcher, are retelling those stories in order to make meaning and make co created, <laughs> co constructed. <laughs> However, in the retellings, there is no set goal create a findings and discussion of your findings. So what I did was I wrote a play um, titled Step Out of Doors. And earlier I mentioned emerging tensions. Often when you are working with participants, tensions will arise. Maybe your ethical, moral beliefs about teaching and there's, there is a, a disconnect or a clash. And so tensions will arise. Therefore, after I had interviewed my participants and I sent them the transcripts, my participants did not want to engage in conversations around improving their teaching practices. So therefore, I wrote a play of imagined conversations. However, this play included all of my participants' direct quotes. I did not change their words. I took their words from the interviews and constructed them into these research texts in which we pretended that we were sitting at a kitchen table and my participants were sitting with, with theorists and having a conversation around how they could improve their, their pedagogy, how they could support students, how they could become lifelong learners. The other part of the research text that is included in my work is a podcast. At Purdue University, I teach first year undergraduate students who want to be teachers. And I have found that they respond positively to podcasts. So I took my findings from my study and I turned them into audio recorded podcasts in which I answered their questions. Slide 20, please. Thank you. So with the remaining time, I just wanted to add my suggestions, um, my advice, if you are thinking about a narrative inquiry. The first piece is I highly recommend 
you reflecting on the scholarly significance. A narrative inquiry can technically be a study about anything. But what I find most profound are studies that are relevant, that especially within education, where can I help support, move education research forward, um, support marginalized groups. Um, And so I recommend um, a literature review um, as the first step review dissertations on narrative inquiry, review recently published articles on narrative inquiry, because it will ground your own work, what research is needed, and where you can be a a voice and fill potential research gaps. As far as methods, alignment is essential to a narrative inquiry. As you are thinking about your research wonders, your potential site, who you want to work with as a a participant. Because again, we enter into this collaborative relationship with our participants. Um, The methods become very important. Are you interviewing? Are you collecting artifacts from your participants? Some narrative inquiries ask participants to journal, to write their own narratives, to write collaboratively with a researcher. These are all things um, that I recommend you thinking about before um, you enter into a narrative research project. Also the ethical piece. I worked with teachers, but I also indirectly worked with vulnerable children populations. And therefore, that does take a toll on your mental health as a researcher. I also live in my area where I research that also has a profound impact on my family, on my work. And it's important to consider all of these pieces when entering into a narrative inquiry. And then finally, the participants' perspectives. Often you will meet participants whose backgrounds differ from your own, whose political, social, economic backgrounds are different, and therefore that mutual respect and trust are so important and cannot be ignored in a research design. Uh, 21, please. Thank you. Also, research questions. um, And this is where a literature review or reviewing several um, articles within the field of narrative is incredibly important. Um, How do researchers craft their open-ended questions? They really are research puzzles because they do research, my narrative research wonders, my questions were very complex, not easy to answer for a reason. And even now, two years, three years after that particular uh, project was over, I still have more questions than answers. Um, As I mentioned, interviews, interviews, we, we design semi-structured questions But as a narrative inquirer, especially if you are new qualitative researcher, asking questions that lead to conversations where your participants feel comfortable opening up to you and telling you a story is very important because their stories are part of your research puzzle. And without them, Um, it is not a narrative inquiry. Uh, Slide 22, please. Thank you. Uh, As far as data collection is concerned, uh, narrative inquiry, it does take practice. Um, It is something that I continuously um, work on. Each participant is different. 
and being able to read a participant when a question makes them uncomfortable, when a question um, doesn't doesn't open up to another another question. And so it's there's definitely an art form in developing those questions. Field work, this is something that as a narrative inquirer, I highly recommend observations because it's another layer to a very multi-layered project. And then as I mentioned earlier, artifacts. What um, what do your participants, this could be photographs, this could be um, audio, uh, it, this could be you know, things that they have, um, if they're teachers, things within their classroom that help them to tell their story. Next slide, please. Coding is one of those very interesting and delicate and very personal pieces within narrative. Again, there is no map on how to code, um, but it has to make sense to you. So some researchers use um, Envivo and other um, programs to help them organize their data. I happened to code everything by hand so that that took so much longer. A narrative inquiry definitely takes a tremendous amount of time if done well. Um, but when you decide on, on which coding method best suits your particular style, um, you will come up with categories that make sense or themes um, or even patterns. And this generally comes by way of the interviews, depending on how you structured those interviews. I had themes that sort of emerged, for lack of a better word, um, that um, I found profound um, across all of my participants. But I also, because I was working with four different participants, um, each of their own stories were unique in themselves. And so it was hard to, to categorize them across. And maybe that's where narrative is unique um, if you're comparing it to case study, um, it's not bounded. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and then, of course, just again to remind um, everyone this morning, data analysis and interpretation. This is also an area that takes a tremendous amount of time to reflect um, in terms of your participants' past and their presence and their future um, and, and how you go about this is, uh, you know, again, there is no wrong way to analyze your data, which is a beautiful thing and also frustrating because um, it, it really is, is a full immersion by a researcher into their data to see what, what comes to the surface and, and how you make meaning um, with, uh, and there are other ways to analyze data, but um, Polkinghorne is probably the most um, prominent form of analysis with a narrative. And then slide 25, please. And lastly, but not least, um, in terms of narrative form, it's, you are writing a story, you are telling a story, and it's, it's interesting to remember, again, that it is a snapshot in time of your participants. And so when you are thinking about all of the elements of a story, it's very similar to that. Um, and it's, it's interesting the way I chose to write a play, and, and as I mentioned, a podcast, but um, there are narrative inquiries that are, are beautiful audio and visuals. Um, and so it, it's, it's very non-traditional. 
And when I was writing my dissertation, it was very non-traditional. And even my book is the same way, uh, which I think makes narrative a very powerful form of methodology, um, a very um, empowering form of methodology. It's it's something that um, can take whatever shape you want it to, which I, I love and I, I find very, um, it's, it's my favorite of all, the, of all the methodologies, I have to say. So with that, um, my formal presentation is over. If there are questions, I am happy to answer them. And I hope um, this, you found this helpful. I do have a list of references and I'm happy at any point, if you reach out to answer any questions you have, because um, narrative is is complex, but also it is it's a very profound methodology. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comprehensive presentations, Dr. Stephanie. Thank you, Thank you very much. That was a brilliant presentation, and I'm sure. Uh, uh, some of us might still be uh, wondering uh, and would like to pose some questions in relation to you know, particular aspects of your presentations. So if I may uh, try to highlight your presentation, uh, Dr. Stephanie has uh, uh, shed light on a, a number of uh, key important uh, uh, elements or aspects of narrative inquiry. Uh, among the things that you know, this narrative inquiry could uh, be approached you know, through uh, uh, different ways uh, uh, of uh, making sense of the data uh, through the terms big rollage, yes. And also, uh, the importance of building reflexivity into the data analysis, as well as the importance to acknowledge the temporality and the social sociality of the uh, occasions when we do the interview. Uh, as a researcher, we need to also uh, be uh, aware of the uh, Dynamics, dynamics, yeah, involved during the view, and at the same time, perhaps try to be uh, sympathetic and showing empathy to the participants as well. And another thing that uh, I try to capture here is uh, the the use of narrative uh, uh, to allow us to tap into the uh, perhaps the, the most intimate you know, struggles of the individuals. And this will allow us to uh, understand in a more profound way of how uh, individuals make sense of the lived experience. And in this case, and it, it would be very interesting if we uh, do this narrative inquiry uh, uh, into the uh, lived experience of our students, for example, in educational context. And also the, 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 the interesting part, I think that uh, Dr. Stephanie was, uh, revealed during the presentation is the fact that uh, Doing a narrative inquiry would allow us to uh, examine, yeah, and also amplify the the so-called uh, underrepresented narratives, mm -hmm. um, the voices of those who uh, have been marginalized. I think I think this this would uh, uh, to, to a greater extent resonate with with us as teachers uh, as. Uh, educational practitioners who sometimes, you sometimes have to be confronted with the, the so-called uh, authoritative uh, discourse, which we find sometimes uh, uh, slightly in opposition to what we believed as teachers at the forefront of education. 
So with that in mind, I would like to invite uh, questions from the audience here, perhaps, yes. Um, uh, before you ask a question, make sure you you have a questions in mind, and I would I would uh, suggest that uh, you uh, formulate your questions in the most uh, succinct in a succinct way, perhaps one or two sentences, and yeah, I would allow uh, the first two questions, perhaps from the audience. Uh, hold on. Uh, uh, just for your information, I have shared the PowerPoint as well as the references uh, from uh, Dr. Stephanie's uh, presentation. So please uh, make sure you check on the chat box. Yes, I have shared both of them. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Budi. Hey, Mr. Bailey. Yes, uh, Papa Joko Subagio from yeah. Amka. Yeah. yeah. Would you like to ask a question? Yes, of course. Thank you for your uh, time. Uh, my name is Joko. I'm from Amka, and I'm concerned about uh, qualitative research and again because of my presentations uh, using the theory. But I think uh, I want to ask briefly uh, from Dr. Stefani. First of all, I want to ask about uh, what kinds of problems are suitable for using narrative research. Second, how long have we been with the participants? And the last is it text analysis cost or retelling uh, when your analysis uh, the data. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, Baba Joko, there is a, a bit of glitch. Yes. There are some glitches here uh, during your uh, uh, speech. Okay. Okay. Could you please, uh, sorry. Could you please uh, ask? Yes. Could you please uh, re. Uh, what is it? Think, Ask the question well, number, two. Been, number two. Uh, number two. Number two. Yeah. Number two. Number okay. two. And number three. Yes. Okay. Well, all right. Uh, number two is how long have we been with the participants uh, during the research? And then is it text analysis or retelling uh, in analysis uh, the data? Thank you, Mr. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, the second questions, I think I will uh, limit uh, to uh, two questions. Second questions. All right, so maybe uh, I will uh, ask uh, Dr. Stephanie to respond to the questions here. So I hope I can... Uh, get this correct, uh, Dr. Stephanie. Number one, the questions from uh, Papa Joko, yes. Number one is what kind of problems or what kind of, uh, yes, okay, topics might be uh, suitable uh, to be uh, researched you know, through this narrative inquiry. And then in regard to your research, uh, he was asking how long were you, how long were you uh, with the participants? How much time did you spend working with the participants? And then uh, would you say that uh, textual analysis or, and narrative inquiry uh, actually have the, perhaps the similarity uh, in, in in, in, in to some extent. So perhaps the question is, how does textual analysis you know, differ from a narrative inquiry? Yeah. Would you please you know, respond? To yes, this thank, thank you. you. The first, to answer um, the first question, I would say that the topic or problem 
that you want to focus your narrative inquiry on would be something that connects to you personally. Because within a narrative inquiry, there is that autobiographical component. I would recommend something, a, a topic you're passionate about. So for me, it was very much my own teacher identity. Um, while I was born in the United States, my father was born in Morocco. And therefore, uh, my family's own immigration story was very much part of my own research. So of course, I was interested in immigrants who were students in the United States. So I would say my recommendation would be a topic, a problem that you that you're interested in that that has a personal connection to you and that you can spend quite a bit of time with because a narrative inquiry does take quite a bit. That follows up to the second question about how long. There's no prescribed time, but for me a narrative inquiry is is a minimum six months to a year. Most of my narrative inquiries have been at least one year or longer um, because you want that rich, in-depth data. And of course, it takes time to build a relationship with a participant. Um, in terms of the last question, there are elements of it, that's the interesting part about narrative is that it it touches so many different types of methodology um, of data analysis and so there is textual there can be textual analysis within a narrative inquiry if that makes sense for you it could be the the sole component of your analysis it could be one one piece of it uh, and so Going back to the whole idea of bricolage, there's no need to separate it out. Uh, it can definitely be folded into it. So if that's that's textual analysis is something you are familiar with and comfortable with, I would and and of course it makes sense in terms of alignment. I would definitely incorporate it into your own work. That, that again, that is the nice and convenient and wonderful part of narrative is that it can be so many things. I hope that answered. Oh, I, I see a question in the chat. May I oh, answer okay. it? <laughs> <laughs> so, subject, avoid subjectivity in narrative. Oh, that's a wonderful question. Uh, um, when, when I was a very early researcher, I truly believed that research was neutral, that as a researcher, you enter into a site as a neutral participant. Um, and that is not the case um, because this is a narrative inquiry and there are those personal components. Um, it's, it is a part of you. A lot of times that's where the tensions emerge. And so being aware of any bias, um, being aware of your positionality, early on is incredibly important. So, and I was very upfront with my participants. I, I specifically told them, you know, I am, I, I have, my family has an immigrant past. My family speaks multiple languages. Um, and most of my participants were white, US, Christian, um, monolingual. And so we had very different backgrounds, but, but I, you know, I was very candid about that and very honest with them and, and they respected that. Um, so, I, but of course, um, it's, it's hard to remember. There's no such thing as a, you know, a neutral a participant or new, neutral researcher. And um, you just have to positionality, your own voice. Um, and I do have, um, Within that reference sheet, there are quite a few books by Clandon and Connolly or and articles that speak specifically to a researcher's um, subjectivity and voice. And, and so that might be very helpful as well. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, another questions, please. Uh, I was wondering if you have responded responded to the questions posed during your presentation. 
So let me try to read the questions here, Dr. Stephanie. Uh, from Pak Adi Brehanto, uh, UPI, uh, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. Uh, the question is, is it possible if I would have done it in one field or place? Uh, so then he refers to uh, Clifton Gates' work, okay. which talks about insider perspective, I think, mm -hmm. and he did qualitative approach. How do we become insider within our research? And is it the same way being insider during uh, using narrative? Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question as well. Yeah. Um, and that's something that I, I continue to struggle with in my own work, that idea of insider, outsider. It's, you know, I honestly feel the only way you can be an insider within narrative inquiry is within that auto ethnographic autobiographical piece because you are you know yourself right the, the identity piece um, is incredibly important um, but then when you're when you're interacting with participants there's always that that outs I mean there are there are touchstones in which you can make meaningful connections and um, you can have shared experiences, but it's your participants are still their own, you know, their own experiences are still something that that you have to honor. And as you're co-creating that meaning, which is very, very delicate and intricate within narrative, that co-created meaning. Um, my participants for my book did not want to co-create meaning they um, they were done once they were, had been interviewed and I, they had invited me into their classroom. But after those steps had that data analysis was done, they were done. And that made co-creating meaning difficult. However, right now I am working with a teacher um, in another very long in-depth narrative inquiry and we are co-creating stories together and it's beautiful. It is, it is everything you want out of a narrative inquiry. So it's, you, you just have to work the very best you can with your participants because you don't know what that relationship will look like until you are in it, in the midst of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question? Okay, well, sorry, we... sir. There is uh, someone who raised oh. hand from Hana Lestari. Hana Lestari. Okay. Yes. Could you please? Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning, um, sir, and also the speakers. I am Herna. I'm from Bali. I am so excited to hear the presentation because I am a new researcher in qualitative and especially I am interested in narrative inquiry. I have an idea in my classroom because it is an education. I encourage my students in the classroom. I teach in vocational school. I ask them to uh, tell uh, their experience in being a job they they have a daily working uh, because they are in tourism major so they tell their experience being a daily worker or um, experience when they have a training program from the school so um can we um what's that take the experience as the data and use narrative inquiry um, because as far I listen to the materials it's all about the roles of the participants and also um, the researcher need to analyze from the experience so is that all about the roles of the participants? So that's a great question thank you um, I recommend as a new researcher um, investigating all of the rules that come with whichever country you are in. So because there is that ethical piece. So for example, in the United States, when um, I want to conduct research with children, I have to go through Purdue University and the Institutional Review Board 
Um, it is more difficult uh, in the United States to collect data from individuals under the age of 18 um, than it is over the age of 18, but I still have to receive research permission. Um, once I can do that, then I can collect data from students, I can interview them, I can, I can collect their artifacts, their writings. So yes, um, you could definitely conduct um, research with students and it, and it sounds like your students would be a great um, you know, future participant um, and you have a site already. I would just recommend um, making sure you have the rules for the ethics of, of uh, interviewing and, and researching children. Okay. The participants actually uh, are in college, so it is possible to conduct okay. interviews, right? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you for the questions and the response from Stephanie. Uh, perhaps one more question. Yes. Oh. Uh, yes, or perhaps from me as the moderator, <laughs> Stephanie. Um, I, sorry, oh. sir. Yep. There is a question from Miss Ratri there. Miss Ratri, uh, she has asked uh, questions. Yes, uh, there is on the chat box. Oh, okay. Before. She oh, asked subject. The yeah. Before. There's the already. last. The last already. message it has, there. Oh. It okay. has been responded already. Okay. Yeah, it's about subjectivity. Mm -hmm. But I am happy, I know there's a lot of information in a short amount of time. So I am happy to, if students want to email me, I can um, I can answer questions that way as well because um, that there, be there's a lot of reflecting. So <laughs> feel free to email you. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So my last question is Dr. Stephanie. Sure. <laughs> Okay, uh, during the interview with students, with your participants, how would you actually uh, navigate yourself through the need for, for example, building uh, a rapport with students? And at the same time, perhaps, I know that within this uh, relativist ontology, so we are allowed to build our reflexivity into this, you know, uh, process of data collections and how would you actually balance these two different uh, purposes for example the need yeah okay I think that's it. <laughs> sorry no you're fine no that's <laughs> that's a great question it's yeah it's really you know that that initial interview with participants is really key because I um, will share just a brief background with about myself you know my research my teaching and all that um, maybe my schooling experiences as a student, but then I will, my first question is always, you know, tell me about yourself, what, what, um, you know, your background, um, you know, about your family, whatever you feel comfortable sharing. And then um, from that, I, I try to build my other questions around, obviously I have my own research questions, but I want to make them feel comfortable and to really, um, you know, to tailor my questions around who they are as individuals. So no two interviews that I conduct are ever the same because they have to be, you know, specifically tailored. And then, um, oh, and then remind me your second part, I'm sorry. It's, okay. The, no, it's uh, been. <laughs> yeah, the, uh... To 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 I, uh, my my uh, questions is actually related to the the fact that you know in a qualitative research you know, we depart from this relativist ontology right so so it involves our you know, subjectivity as well and reflexivity as well now this might be slightly different from what I asked before <laughs> I forget. So no, uh, you're fine. How, the, how, would, the, uh, how would you actually, uh, for example, make sense of the data, the the small talk lessons? Uh, uh, okay. Using using the idea of bric bricolage, you know, 
I understand that there is you know, methodological bricolage and then theoretical bricolage. Would you suggest that you know, uh, in order to uh, uh, provide a, a profound, in-depth portrayal of the students or the participant lived experience, will you suggest uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, using this theoretical bricolage so to allow you for a a lot, uh, a lot more uh, profound and deeper analysis of the talks, the, the, the small conversations here at the higher level of granulations. Thank you. Yes, I agree. I mean, um, thank you for your question. It's, it does, that, that analysis part takes time that reflecting on what the participants say, how they say it. So for example, um, I had a, I interviewed a teacher and she was very, very like, agitated, very angry throughout the entire interview. And I couldn't figure out why um, I had to, I, so I listened to the audio recording and then um, we scheduled an, a follow-up interview. And I, I had to take myself, it, it a strange way, I had to sort of step back from my own self and sort of put myself in her shoes and think about what she was going through, not just as a teacher and a job, but she was going through, she had just had a child and she was going through a lot of emotional things. And so I had to really think about her perspective and then sort of tailor my questions to come at it a different angle, if that makes sense. And so that, that I, I love bricolage because it does it's not just one thing. Like I might be thinking of, of my research through care, but I have to consider all of the other pieces that, that, you know, I have to think about my participant holistically, I guess is the best way to answer that. And that's also why a narrative inquiry is so challenging because um, I can share my experiences with, this is what I did with a narrative inquiry, but until a researcher is really in it and, and, very much living in the data and we talk about the researcher being in their own instrument you know the right way to analyze data and to um you know to really uh create those those research texts becomes so nuanced and that's not a really good answer but it's <laughs> it's um so i when i work with graduate students who are thinking about narrative inquiry i work very closely with them because mm. um you know they their their challenges are going to be very unique to their work. Thank you very much sure. for sure. your answer, Dr. Stephanie. Uh, do we still have time, uh, the MC? No? Sure, yes, sure, yes. sir. Sure. Yes, I perhaps. I question about consent. May I answer that? Yes, uh, suppose. Oh, sure. Yeah, all right. Okay. Um, so I uh, create a, um, I create research protocols. Um, I have a specific document um, that I use with my participants to explain the study, what they are, the research that they are participating in, that they always have a choice to answer a question, to not answer a question. And then I have them sign a consent form so that that is my documentation that I am being very ethical um, and that they always constantly understand throughout the entire research process uh, what, what their role as a participant is. So that's a great question. Mm, okay. Yes, uh, still have time. <laughs> More questions. <laughs> what time is it uh, in uh, Indiana, Dr. Stephanie? I am 12 hours ahead of yes. you, so it is 9.08 p.m. Okay, I wish it would not be too late for you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. Okay. Uh, perhaps, uh, uh, yeah, waiting for the perhaps the last questions. Would you suggest uh, this, you know, uh, uh, methodological uh, inquiry, the narrative inquiry mm -hmm. to, for example, to examine, to investigate uh, how 
uh, teaches uh, response to, for example, a uh, policy, the struggles, the internal struggles that teacher experience, you know, in responding to, you know, policy uh, uh, which is imposed, you know, upon us mm -hmm. as teachers. Would you recommend this kind of, uh, you know, this narrative inquiry? So as compared to, for example, case study or even, you know, because in most cases, we, we've been doing, for example, a survey, you know, to, oh, sure. <laughs> to understand teachers' perceptions. And I thought, to be honest, I thought, you know, it, 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 in, in, uh, at best, it can only provide uh, the explanation, the descriptions of the phenomena we want to investigate at this, you know, surface level. And I was just wondering if you would recommend, you know, narrative inquiry. Uh, although we still have, you know, a lot of questions, and we still, I myself are still struggling, especially when it comes to the presentations of this, you know, uh, narrative inquiries findings. Yeah. yeah, it's that's a great point, and that's where you will get pushed back with narrative that you know, is it is it rigorous enough? Is it you know because anyone who lives in the quantitative world will say surveys, you know, that that gets to the heart of of what we're doing. But, <laughs> <laughs> and I have nothing wrong with surveys. I once in yeah. a while I'll throw a survey at a teacher, but I do find that conversations, you know, teachers just like any other group want to be heard and valued. I don't know um, about you, but in the United States, teachers, you know, it is not a it is not a profession that we know we need teachers. We have a teacher shortage in the United States, but um, you know, as far as teacher voice. Um, people are leaving the profession because they don't feel that they're being heard. And so that's why I do recommend narrative because it does, you know, it's, it's a lengthy methodology. It takes time. Um, it's not easy to, you know, engage in these intimate relationships. I mean, with, you know, quantitative, I can have a hundred participants if I want with narrative, I might have three, but those three meaningful experiences are very eye-opening um you know especially in my own work i the more i talk to teachers um and 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 research with them it's it's just very eye-opening so i you know i'm a big fan of narrative um, some people like mixed methodology you know i i say pick one <laughs> so mixed <laughs> is kind of interesting to me but <laughs> i don't feel like you do one well if you're doing mixed but that's just a Another. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we talk actually about levels of depth, actually, isn't it? Oh, because before before, uh, you know, I heard your presentation today, I thought mm -hmm. narrative inquiry would be very simple. But then uh, depending <laughs> on how much. <laughs> so how much reflexivity, how much, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, depth that we want to uh, present, right? It's it, we talk about right. levels of knowledge because, to be honest, I came across, uh, let's say, a research article uh, uh, using this methodology, and I thought, wow, it's it's quite simple. But this research claims to have adopted this narrative inquiry. Your comment on that? <laughs> no, that's a great, and I I think. You know, at least, okay, and I apologize for keep using US context, but in the United States, it's all about publishing quickly, right? So <laughs> how many yeah. articles can you get published? Um, and so people will either do a very short narrative inquiry, um, you know, but I, to me, uh, and that's why you often find narrative inquiries that are published into books because they are so in depth and it does take a lot of time. It's the same thing with like ethnography. Um, if you really want to understand social context, I mean, it, it takes time. And um, so I'm sure, and, and I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I guess I haven't, I've never done a short one. I probably, maybe I'll try that sometime. That's a good experiment. <laughs> um, but um, no, simple, I would definitely not say simple. Um, it's, mm. it's quite complex, but I think it would be really interesting if, if you all tried one and to see how it went, because, um, yeah. you know, it's, you have to keep me posted because I, I love it. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Now, sure. unless there's a questions, I want to ask one last question and demand actually, Dr. Stephanie. <laughs> yes. <Sure. laughs> 
Yes. Yes. Oh, as you know, we, you know, we, you know uh, lecturers across the faculty, actually, you know, uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, in, in general, I, I think there is uh, enthusiasm here. Yeah, across the faculties. May, may I give the response? Oh, okay, okay. Yes. One last okay. question, One yeah. last question. Yeah. Before yeah. I, yeah, I let uh, Dr. Stephanie know my request, final, okay, after sure. my request. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stephanie. Uh, I'd love uh, to make, maybe, can I, uh, collaborate uh, with you uh, with yes. my my field <laughs> my field in in mathematics education okay. and I think uh, mathematics education I'm sorry uh, I I turn off the video maybe uh, it uh, takes the bandwidth okay okay so if I want to uh, study uh, in mathematics education uh, with narrative study so can I including uh, including uh, you I, I mean collaborate with you maybe by email so I can conduct the narrative study uh, in mathematics education because uh, I've seen in Google Scholar as uh, it's so so rare uh, how uh, the narrative study you see, in advanced education. So I, I want to hear from you, Dr. Stefan. May I, can I, or maybe in uh, another person in, in this room can collaborate because, uh, yeah, in mathematics okay. education, uh, the research is still real. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so, but Joko, you are seeing yeah. the possibility of, you know, collaborating. Yeah, yeah, right. Mr. Right. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. please uh, response, doctors. Thank you, thank you. Sure, I actually have um, some colleagues at Purdue University that are in mathematics education that uh, interact with narrative and self-study, which is sort of another branch, um, which I didn't talk about tonight. So um, if you email me, I am happy to, um, I can send you a few articles to get you started on mathematics <laughs> education, and then we can go from there. Sure, thank because you, it's you. it is emerging within STEM. So yeah, I completely understand. Okay. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. That would be the last questions that we have today. And okay. yes, I was actually going to ask you something which is very much touched on by Mr. Joko. Okay. <laughs> My ultimate request. <laughs> As we actually feel enthusiastic about doing, you know, pursuing this mm -hmm. kind of research, then, and, uh, and also it's it's very much a thing, uh, given the fact that what you have mentioned, this this kind of research would allow us to actually uh, tap into these underrepresented voices, you know, mm -hmm. deep down there. So, uh, and uh, I can see the, how this kind of uh, methodological uh, uh, options could actually uh, help us, yeah, uh, resolve you know some of the issues uh, around education and 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 uh, beyond actually. So my questions to you is because as far as I have observed here at the you know, across the faculty at Wadi, would you be <laughs> Willing, yeah. One day, if one of the lecturers here uh, get in touch you know, with you, and let's say, uh, then attach, you know, through the emails, um, a research proposals, yeah. Oh, yes. To work with you, yeah, as a you know, as a collaborative research, would you be uh, interested, and would you be willing to? Uh, I say it's not really, it's not the right word. Is it? <laughs> would you, let's say, would you be interested and um, uh, provided that you know uh, it is, uh, it has uh, um, uh, every reasons for you to, to accept this, you know, offer mm -hmm. a request for collaborations? Would you? 
Yes, I'm always looking for collaborations because like I said, narrative is something I'm very passionate about, um, especially with emerging qualitative researchers. So yes, let's, um, you know, let me, um, let me send me an email and let me know what you're thinking, um, especially, you know, talking to your faculty, but I would love it because, um, you know, I, that's my, my program area within Purdue. That's, that's what we do. We're qualitative researchers. And um, I mentioned Dr. Masta's work. She and I work closely together. So um, yes. Yeah, so let me know what you're thinking, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> you're <Yeah>. welcome. <laughs> Excellent. So, so we have witnesses here, Dr. Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has just witnessed this, uh, let's okay. say, uh, online MOU between, you know, <laughs> you <laughs> and Uade and others, yeah, perhaps. So that's pretty much uh, for today. Thank you very much. And that wraps up our uh, session today with our notable speaker, Dr. <laughs> Stephanie Odgiri from the Indiana Oh, sorry, the Purdue University, Indiana, USA. Thank you very much. I should go back to the MC here. I think there will be some, what is it, sessions uh, of uh, awarding uh, certificates uh, and so on. Thank, thank you very much from me as the moderator. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. It was nice meeting you all. Have a good day. I'm thank going to bed now. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Stephanie. Thank you, Dr. Stephanie. Let's give a big applause to Dr. <laughs> Stephanie. Okay. Oh, sorry. Thank Liz. you. Uh, can you not l logging off before we sure. go to the next agenda? Okay. Thank you so much for Dr. Stephanie and also Mr. Budari for today's presentation. Before we go to the next agenda, I want to remind the participant to. Uh, fill the attendance list first don't forget because there will be a certificate for you and the next agenda is uh, Mrs. Stratri as the, ha as the lecturer of English education study program will symbolically present a, an, a certificate uh, for Dr. Stephanie and please for Mrs. Stratri time is yours thank you okay thank you Aisa well, uh, Dr. Stephanie, okay, yeah. Dr. Stephanie, on behalf of the head of English Education Department of Universitas Ahmad Dahlan, uh, we will express our gratitude. Uh, thank you for the inspiring and enlightenment you've given to us about narrative inquiry. And we will deliver this certificate as the appreciation for you as our uh, international guest lecturer today. And this certificate will also be delivered through your email, Dr. Stephanie. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks once again, Dr. Stephanie. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I Bye. Back to you, Aisa. Okay, thank you so much, Mrs. Ratri and also Dr. Stephanie. But before we close the agenda, I want to all of you to open the camera first because you will take a picture together. Okay. 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 Good. I will count for is it ready, operator? Okay. I will count. One, two, three, cheers. Okay. Once again. One, two, three, cheers. Okay, thank you so much everyone. I am Aisa Hril Surya representing all of the committees. I would like to say thank you so much for your participation and let's close our event today by reciting Hamdalah together. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. See you on the next webinar. Thank you so much. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.